quickly summarize the uh, our uh, one thing which I am really proud of, and uh, that is we have really re-engineered our entire advertising management process and built something called LXR GPT, which so think of it almost like an ERP program within our company, which through which we are able to manage all the advertising programs in Google and Meta, and everything is prompt driven. That has really been able to extract almost about 40% incremental efficiency in the entire process. So the LXR GPT, again, is something that we are very excited about, uh, just because it really makes the entire thing scalable. This 40% time, the team is able to spend in thinking of new ideas and new solutions. So that was something which uh, we firmly believe may be the, the direction of the future uh, for every company as such, re-engineering this process and really using uh, generative AI to redefine this. So that was my innovation, right? So a 15-minute presentation in two minutes, which is not bad. Uh, I have the great privilege of welcoming uh, Professor Sheena Iyengar from uh, Columbia Business School. Now, Sheena, I don't think needs any introduction. She is, uh, she is quite a legend in the space of the, the art of choosing, considered to be one of the world's topmost authorities in terms of the choice architecture. She recently came up with a a book which really has been grabbing a lot of attention. Just to give you a sense as to how much attention, Sheena is, as I mentioned to some of the folks who joined us for dinner yesterday, she came back from Helsinki. She was speaking at the Nordic Business Forum with lesser known people like Malala and so on. So anyway, I think there were some, some people that may, some of us may have heard of. Uh, before that, she was in Tunisia, and on Monday, she travels to Nashville for another presentation. So this, this book is taking the innovation world by a bit of a storm. And I had requested her to do a workshop for all of our attendees. Now, the afternoon session, in the, the way that we have structured X equals experience, for those of you who are attending the first time, the morning session is more theory. This is more practical. So we'll really, uh, I think, sort of let uh, Eleanor and Sheena uh, really define as to how do you really define the different groups and so on. But uh, that's my short introduction. Uh, Sheena also has been kind enough to sign her books as well. We'll mm -hmm. be distributing the books to all of you after her presentation as well. But thank you very much, Sina. Well, that's fascinating. I would have been happy to sit here and listen to every single person's innovation, because it sounds like you're doing some really, really, really cool stuff. Um, how many of you? Uh, so I'm blind, so only raise your hands in my direction, obviously, if you want to burn off some calories. Um, otherwise, you know, when I ask you a question, please just, you know, either answer me or if you really need to, you can put your hand in the direction of Eleanor. But how many of you have heard me before? Yes. Anybody? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So you've heard me speak on choice. Okay. Yeah, it was okay. Very good. That's back. Oh, oh, thank you. <laughs> What's your name? Steve. Hi, Steve. Um, okay, so what I'm going to talk about today is how to innovate. And in particular, what I'm going to do is answer the question, where do we get our best ideas from, who gets them, and how do we get them? And I'm essentially going to draw upon neuro and cognitive science to answer this question because, you know, you have a lot of people talking about the theory behind it. You have a lot of people talking about concepts like brainstorming or mind wandering or daydreaming. And we often talk about innovation as if it's like magic that'll come to you maybe when you're you know, on a jog or taking a nap or doing some rut routine activity like cooking or driving, et cetera. Well, it actually turns out now that thanks to recent advances in neuro, neuro and cognitive science, and when I talk about cognitive science, I'm talking about the work that I've done. Uh, and other researchers in the space of what's known as judgment and decision making and behavioral economics and choice curation, but also the work in neuroscience, like the Nobel Prize winning work of Eric Kendall. Now, I'm not going to give you a long lecture on you know, all the, the theory and all the describe every single portion of the brain, but what I am going to do is take the knowledge that we've gotten from those studies and essentially give you a toolkit by which you could apply it to your everyday choice making, right? So essentially the Think Bigger toolkit that you have in the book, which I've been developing for the last eight years, is a toolkit that you can use, whether it's for making complex choices, meaning choosing or picking, as I call it, or whether it's for creating a meaningful choice. It really can be used for, for either one of those. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to do some hands-on exercise because we're not going to talk about innovation in a vacuum. We're going to actually get our hands dirty um, and do a little creativity exercise. And so the way I'm going to structure our time together is you're going to do an exercise and I'm going to give you a brief explanation of how our mind actually creates thoughts. Then we're going to talk about real world case examples of how those great innovations were created and all of you will end up being able to add to that list. Um, and then I'm going to show you the tool. Okay, so I know you have notebooks in front of you. And why don't you open those up to a blank page. And we're going to get our hands dirty. And yes, it is, it is actually better that you do it on a piece of paper, even though you could actually technically do this on a, a phone. But I prefer if you just use it, do the old-fashioned way. Okay. Now, imagine, so this is a fun, think of this as a creativity warm-up exercise. So imagine I were to give you a pile of toothpicks, just a big pile, bundle toothpicks, and I were to give you two minutes to come up with as many different uses for toothpicks as you can think of. So you can use one or more toothpicks. So I'm going to give you two minutes, and Eleanor is going to start the timer. You can't, this is not a group exercise. You do this as an individual. All right, count up how many ideas you got and call out some numbers. Okay, did I, I heard somewhere between five and 11. Anybody have more than 11? Who had 11? Three people had 11. And what are your names? Okay, nobody had, and so you guys are the winners, okay? 11 ideas. Now, let's imagine I were to give you another two more minutes. I want you to make a prediction. How many more ideas do you think you can generate? Three. Okay, so less than three. Okay. Oh, no, I less than 11. Less than 11, okay? And give me a guess. Maybe four or five. Okay, so I'm hearing somewhere between, you guys aren't very optimistic, but somewhere between zero and five. That sound right? Okay, maybe. Okay, I'm, I am going to give you another two minutes, and I want you to put it on a new piece of paper, please. Put it down round two. I'm going to give you another two minutes. Your new ideas cannot be redundant with the ideas you already have. They have to be totally different ideas. Again, new uses for toothpicks. Ready? Okay, two minutes, starting now. Give me your best. <laughs> Okay, now count up and tell me how many ideas you got. Call. Okay, is 11 the highest? Anybody have more than 11? What's your name? Susan. Susan. Susan's our winner. Okay. Now imagine I were to ask you to do this again. How many more ideas do you think you could come up with? Wow. Huh? Three, ten, what did you say? Less than the last one. Less than one, okay. All right, well, I know you're going to think I'm crazy. There is a method to my madness. I want you to turn the page over, and I want you to do round three. Now, I know you guys are getting a little bored, and you're going to be like looking around the room, maybe staring out the window, wondering about the sculptures that you just saw in the garden. So to help your daydreaming along, I'm going to show you a picture. 
It has nothing to do with toothpicks, but if it inspires you, that's up to you. And I'm gonna give you the last round of two minutes. The last round. So two minutes, more uses for toothpicks. It cannot be redundant with what you already have. Okay, you've been thinking about toothpicks now for a while. Count up, how many ideas? Seven, 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 eight, eight, five, eight, seven, eight, seven, eight, seven, eight, seven, eight, seven, eight, eight, ten. Anybody have more than ten? Who had ten? Oh, Sam. Sam. Okay, very nice. All right. So. How many of you had your most number of ideas in round one? Raise your hands. Round two, your most number of ideas? Round three. Yeah. Uh, did you notice, though, that consistently, even though you had more ideas in round one, in round two and round three, you still generated more ideas on average than you thought you would? Yes. Now I want you to look at the content of your ideas. Imagine you could only build one idea from all the ideas you generated, and it's a product that has to make money. What's the best idea you have across all three rounds? You can only pick one. The most creative, most likely to make some money, okay? When did you get that idea? Round one, raise your hands. Round two. Round three. Yes, I feel like I don't even have to tell you the research. You yourself saw it, right? So that's exactly what research shows. Persistence pays off. Get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Because in the beginning, you're in the zone, and it feels really good, and it's coming out fast and furious, and you're convinced you don't have any more left in you, and yet it turns out that it's when you cross that threshold and you keep pushing yourself that A, you produce more than you think you can, and B, that's when your higher quality will come out. How many of you found that putting up those pictures right before round three did something to you? Just changed something in your head about the way you were thinking about the toothpicks. Okay, what did it do? It opened up some new thoughts. Yeah. Tell me, what's your name? You're Steve? I'm David. You're David, okay, sorry. Uh, so how did it open up new thoughts for you, David? Give me an example. Uh, so, for example, the drink, I was like, oh, you could use it as a stirrer. Mm, good. So it gave you an idea for how you might use it. Perfect. Okay. Somebody else. In the bookmark, I gave it to me that the toothpick and bookmark. Toothpick and bookmark. That sparked something for you. Yeah. Okay. Um, can I get a couple of people to share their most interesting idea? Let's start with you, Susan. Sam?
What was your most interesting one? Uh, use it to prick somebody's finger. Okay, good. All right, perfect. So let's now, I'm going to tell you more about what those pictures does as I explain to you how the mind forms thoughts. Okay, so let's talk about how the mind actually forms thoughts. And this was a wonderful illustration in the toothpick exercise as to how you did it. Think of the brain as a giant inventory system. It's like an Excel spreadsheet. Even before you start talking, you're essentially collecting lots and lots of different information bits, which are getting loaded onto different shelves of your brain. And so when I ask you a question, you essentially go to your memory bank and yank that information down. So for example, what's the answer to this question? 60. No, there's no trick there. Okay. What's the answer to this question? No. What's the answer to this question? Does anybody even know? Okay. You wouldn't, unless you know ancient Greek, you're not going to know the answer to this question. So that is a trick. Hmm? Yes. Exactly. So essentially, the answer to this one is also the same. But here's my point. No amount of introspection or reflecting or staring at it is going to give you the answer. If you don't have the information on the shelves of your mind, you're not going to be able to generate the answer. Now, we know this intuitively when it comes to something like this. But just know that when you're solving for a hard problem, a lot of times the reason why you can't solve that hard problem is because you may not actually have what you need in your head to solve it. And divine intervention isn't going to put it there. Now, what about if I were to ask you to come up with a word that rhymes with airplane that's not a real word? Just give me any word. Hmm? Exactly. So what did you do to come up with that? So you said, if a word rhymes with airplane, it has to end with ain, yes? yes? And then I have to put some sounds in front of it that would go with ain. But I know it's not a word like that. Exactly. And now you're comparing it against your knowledge of the English language to make sure it's not a real word. Right. Did you know, what was the process that you used when you did 28 plus 32? So you asked your brain, what's a 2, what's an 8, what's a plus, what's a 3, what's a 2, and what am I supposed to do when I see that? And lo and behold, it spit it out. Did you notice how the process was identical? Whether you were doing a so-called creative task or whether you were doing a so-called mathematical or analytical task? So. The idea that there is something called, or somebody called, a creative type versus an analytic type is a myth. So if you look at physicists versus artists, and you look at their brains as they're doing so-called creative tasks versus more analytical or logical tasks, it turns out that all the portions of their brain are lighting up regardless of what task they're doing. Because whether you're doing a so-called logical or a so-called creative task, they're essentially all lodged in learning and memory. So even if you look at, say, the brain of Einstein, Einstein, whose brain was saved and then preserved and then analyzed to compare it against other people's brains to see how different it was, it's not. <clears throat> there is no evidence to suggest that there is such a thing as a so-called creative type or a creative brain. What would have accounted for his genius, so-called genius? Well, first, his discipline. But second, it's what he put into that memory bank. So he spent a number of years in the Bern Patent Office where he essentially encountered thousands and thousands of patents. He's examining them. He's not just looking at them through Google fast and furious. No, he's processing them. He has to actually read them, understand them. 
then he himself gets involved in creating patents, say around uh, cameras, refrigeration, typewriters, even starts creating some funky blouse. When you ask him, he writes about how it was that time in the patent office, which was where he hatched his most beautiful ideas. So what did we do when we were doing our toothpick exercise? It's all about learning and memory. So in round one, you asked yourself, OK, where have I seen toothpicks? Well, we see it at cocktail parties. You're looking at all the bit times when it was familiar. That's why most of the ideas you generated in round one are fast. But I guarantee you, if I did NLP on it, there would be a lot of redundancy across all your ideas. By round two, you're saying, OK, I've run out of ideas. What do I do? So now you're going to go to other portions of your brain, other shells of your brain, and you're going to ask yourself, OK, well, how do I reframe the question? What does a toothpick remind me of? Well, it kind of reminds me of a stick, or it kind of reminds me of a stirrer. OK, and so well, what other things do we use sticks for? Then by round three, what did I do? I started to give you extra stuff, stimuli, to put in your brain. And now you're looking at that stuff, and you're saying, well, how can I use a toothpick? Like, does this give me ideas for where else could toothpicks could potentially be useful? Now, the only reason why those pictures worked is because you knew fully well how to understand a toothpick and what it could do and what it can't do. And you understood what those pictures were. If either one of those was not true, you would not have been able to take advantage of those pictures that I gave you. Now, before we move on to real examples of innovation in the world, I want to have you see how imagination works and how it's all related to learning and memory. So let's, who's sitting in the back of the room? Who? Oh, yeah. Emily? OK, Emily, great. So Emily, can you turn your face to the back? Just turn around, OK? OK. Now, here's what I want everybody to do. I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to picture Emily from head to toe. Her hair, the color of her eyes, the shape of her eyes, her nose, her cheeks, her mouth, what she's wearing. Is she wearing a watch, any jewelry, a belt, her shoes, everything from head to toe? Everybody have a picture in, her, in their minds of Emily? OK, now open your eyes. Emily, turn around. Stand up. Let everybody see how accurate they were. <laughs> OK? Now, as you look, I want you to raise your hands if you got 30% correct. OK, keep your hands up if it continues to be accurate. 50% uh, correct. OK, 70% correct. OK, 80% correct. OK, 90% correct. Well, Udayan doesn't count. OK, um, okay 100, anybody get 100% correct and it's not Udayan? <laughs> OK. OK, so what did you do when you didn't remember? Did you put a blank space? You can sit down, Emily. Okay. Did you put a blank space in her body? No. no. You filled it in with something that made sense, yes? That's exactly what you're doing when you do imagination. When you're imagining a new product, an idea, you're, you're taking stuff that you already know in your head, and whatever you don't remember, or whatever you don't know an answer to, you're just filling it in with other stuff that feels familiar. Okay, so so that's how that's how we 
That's how we build imagination. It's always based on materials that we already have. So if I want to expand what you're going to do with your imagination, I have to give you more inputs. All right, so now I've shown you, I've talked about how we form thoughts, and we're constantly forming thoughts from the moment we're born till the moment we die, from the moment you wake up in the morning till the moment you go to bed. I mean, unless you're saying the same exact sentence from morning until night, you are engaging in an exercise in creativity every single minute of your life. So, so we're all creative, but obviously we see examples of certain creative uh, you know, examples or certain innovations that are more successful than others. So when you've heard the idea, the phrase, you know, ideas are a dime a dozen or most ideas suck, this is true because we do come up with an awful lot of ideas. So the question is, when do we come up with really great ideas and how do we distinguish amongst the ideas that are phenomenal versus the ones that are maybe just okay? So let me now show you some examples and, and by the way, this method that I'm showing of how we ideate, this is true of everybody. Whether you're an artist, whether you're a scientist, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're a so-called genius, whether you're a so-called normal person, we are all ideating in the same exact way. And when you think about geniuses, what they're doing is just as ordinary as what the ordinary person does when they create something amazing. So take a, take a look at this painting and tell me who made this painting. Just call out. Anybody know? Now you're all nervous. <laughs> no guesses. Ugh. Okay. What about this one? Okay, they were both done by Picasso. Notice the difference? So the first one was made in 1901, the second one was made in 1907. So Thank God he changed his style, otherwise he would have been no different from your typical realist, right? So there was a transformation that happened from 1901 to 1907. And of course, if you read the storybooks, they'll describe him as being a genius that just had this spark that happened almost like magic, and the world has never been the same. After all, he was the most prolific artist of the 20th century. We can actually tell you exactly how he got his idea. <coughs> What was a technology that was invented in the 19th century which entirely disrupted the art world? The camera, exactly. By the way, if you look at quotes from distinguished people in the 1800s, it might feel like you're not sure if you're looking at quotes from the 1800s or for, from today. It's, just take out the word camera and replace it with the word AI. From today, painting is dead. The camera will supplant art altogether. Those were, the, those were the comments. And of course, we all know now through history that if anything, the rise of the camera gave rise to new forms of art like Impressionism, which kind of motivated artists to see the world differently and show us how even ordinary things could be extraordinary. Not only that, the camera gave rise to a new art form called photography. Well, Picasso was raised in the tradition of realism, and he's like struggling to figure out what he's gonna do. And in 1906, Gertrude Stein invites her, him to her salon, where he beholds a famous painting at the time by Matisse, The Joy of Life. Now, Matisse was influenced by his mentor, Cezanne, Five Bathers. Well, Picasso asked Gertrude Stein to arrange a meeting for him with Matisse. And so they meet in a cafe. Now, on his way to the cafe, Matisse happened to buy a little African sculpture that had just come in from one of the colonies. So he brought it with him to the cafe. It is said during the entirety of that meeting, Picasso held that African sculpture and he kept examining its lines and its angles. And that very night, he started to paint La Demoiselle de Avignon. Look at this painting. Look at the influences of Matisse and African sculpture. It starts the tradition of Cubism. 
Now, his contemporary, T.S. Eliot, once quipped, immature poets imitate mature poets steal. So was Picasso a thief, or was he like any innovator, someone who consciously and cleverly combines ideas drawn from distant and diverse sources in a new and meaningful way? Right? We've always heard the phrase that was given to us initially by Schumpeter that all innovations are nothing more, nothing less than a new combination of existing ideas. Now, we all know, though, that all, not all combinations are equal, and some tend to rise above the others. And the question is, under what circumstances do they rise above the others? How do we figure that out? So what Think Bigger strives to do is give people a very structured rather than an organic method for doing that, for expediting what the mind already does. So the definition that I use for innovation in Think Bigger is the useful novel combination of existing ideas that come together to solve for a complex problem. So it all starts with a problem. You're not just generating ideas for the sake of generating ideas. And the combination has to be first and foremost useful and also novel. Now, as you already saw in your own exercise with the toothpicks, you organically will combine anyway. You can combine, as you notice, even across six minutes even for, despite your, you know, your worst predictions about yourself, you still generated, what, an average of at least 15, 20 ideas in a very short period of time. So organically, your brains are, are designed to keep combining, recombining, recombining, and creating endless combinations. What we're talking about right now is can we be not organic about it, can we be far more strategic about it so that we can identify and create those combinations that are solving a problem and are useful and novel. So I'm now going to give you an example of an innovation. I'm going to show you the process that was used for coming up with this innovation. The way I describe this example is very much in line with the method and in line with the homework that I know you were all asked to do, because that way I can jumpstart the process of having you start to think bigger. It turns out that I can, exp I can describe this particular innovation in the way I am going to do, because we have a lot of records for how this person innovated. It also happens to be one of my favorite innovations of all time. Um, this is one of those rare innovations that is ordinary and yet revolutionary. It's revolutionary because everybody loves it no matter where they are in the world, no matter if they are rich or poor, and there is no, I have not yet found a single politician who has said anything negative about this particular innovation, and that is ice cream. Um, <laughs> so, I'm gonna tell you the story of an ordinary woman in the 1800s who was the wife of a chemistry professor. She was a missionary and she was an abolitionist and she did what I think is extraordinary. She was a woman in her 50s and her name was Nancy Johnson. Now, did she invent ice cream? No. She invented the ice cream maker. Ice cream already existed. Did you know that George Washington paid $190 for, and $190 in that period's time, not even in today's dollars, $190 back then for a bucket of ice cream? It was an expensive thing. And the reason why it was so expensive was because you would take a big bowl, you would fill it with ice, and then you would put a smaller bowl, you would fill that with milk, and it would stir, 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 stir. It's getting harder and harder and harder to stir. It's melting as you're stirring it, and it's forming lumps. Not easy work, not easy to get good stuff. Very expensive. So how does she make it accessible? After all, people wanted to eat ice cream. 
So I'm going to now describe to you how she made the ice cream maker. What's the problem she's trying to solve? How do we make the making of ice cream more accessible? Notice at the top, we define the problem. Defining the problem is key. How you define that problem is really, really important. And I want to emphasize that most companies get that wrong. About 72% of companies end up solving for the wrong problems. And never take the defining of the problem as trivial or as self-evident. As Einstein once said, if I had an hour to save the planet, I would spend the first 55 minutes thinking about the problem and the last five minutes thinking about the solution. So how do I make the making of ice cream accessible? What are the biggest challenges confronting the making of ice cream? Well, how do I keep it cold? How do I make the labor easier? How do I prevent the formation of lumps? Since I know a number of you saw some of my earlier talks, notice how it's broken down into three sub-problems. I let people break it up to up to five sub-problems because we know based on cognitive limitations beyond that, it's overwhelming. You're not going to perform well. It turns out that if you take innovations, almost I have yet to find a single innovation from any point in history where if you really take it apart, it's more than three to five really important parts. There might be other, obviously lots of other little, little, little parts, but the core of it will be somewhere between three to five. All right, so we broke it down into, she, broke, she breaks it down into three core challenges. Again, notice how we're defining it. Always, we always define them as questions. The reason why you define it as questions is because that enables you to have an open mind as opposed to, um, as opposed to embedding a solution. All right, so now we have to solve each of these sub-problems or these challenges. So how does she solve it? So she says, well, how am I going to keep it cold? How about if I take a water pail that had already been in existence for 400 years before, much bigger, I'm going to fill it with ice, and now I'm going to put the milk in a vessel which will keep it cold. Now, what's a vessel that would keep something cold? Back then in Philadelphia, men would go to the taverns to have beer in pewter mugs. Why pewter? Because pewter would keep it cold. So and I do mean men, women weren't allowed. So what about if we put the milk in a pewter vessel? How do I make the labor easier? Well, what if I were to use a hand grinder, the kind that were already being used for grinding coffee and spice? So I'm going to attach the spatulas to the hand grinder. Now, how do I prevent the formation of lumps? Well, it turns out that, you know, when I use the normal spatulas, it not only is harder to keep stirring, but it also forms lumps. It is speculated that the reason why she put holes in her spatulas is that she learned this technique from the runaway slaves. Because most often, you know, the life expectancy on a sugar plantation was much lower, and so there were a lot of runaways from there. And the runaway slaves, when they would be able to report that when making molasses, which is stirring hot water with sugar, in order to prevent the formation of crystals, they use spatulas with holes in them. Now, if you put these things together, you have what was dubbed by the Library of Congress in 1843 a disruptive technology. By 1850s, ice cream was all over the place. It, was, it, it changed history in terms of our eating of ice cream. OK, so now notice what we did. And this is very important when solving any sort of a problem. You start by defining the problem. You then break it down into its most important sub-challenge, sub-parts. And I loved what you talked about with the, the uh, baby bottles. 
right? We don't like washing them. You define that problem. How do I make washing baby bottles like easy, like brain dead, like I don't want to do it in the middle of the night, okay? So, and then what are the, what are the big challenges that have to be managed, right? And I imagine one of them had to be how do you keep it, how do you clean it in a way that would actually make sure that it was uh, really clean, right? Um, so you break it down into its most important subparts, and then for each subproblem, you search for how it has been solved. And notice how Nancy isn't just looking in her own industry. She can't look in her own industry. They're not doing it very well. So she goes to other industries to find solutions to analogous problems and imports those solutions in. She Obviously, as she imports them in, she is refining, she is revising, she is adapting, she's doing all that stuff. So it's not stealing, it's more like strategic copying. <laughs> so I could go on and give you more examples like Henry Ford. I know you read about that in the case, so I won't. Did Henry Ford invent the car? No, by the way, neither did Tesla, uh, neither did Elon inv invent the Tesla. Did uh, Henry Ford invent the assembly line? No, that was already a best practice in the car industry. What was his most important contribution for putting cars around the globe? He lowered the price of the car from $2,000 to $350. And how did he do that? He did that by sending an engineer to all the factories around the United States to figure out how to make car production faster. That was the most important question, faster. And they discovered that in the slaughterhouses of Chicago, they had something called a moving disassembly line, right? Because they're disassembling a, a, an animal. And they bring back this concept of moving to car making back then. Before that, it used to be that the humans would go to the car. It wasn't that the car came to the human. Now, by making it a moving assembly line, they now went from taking 12 and a half hours to make a car to three and a half hours to make a car. That was the biggest difference. We did some other things too, like only painting it in black, which also saved on cost. But overall, that was the biggest change. And, and he was able to go from $2,000 to $350. So we all hear the imperative, think out of the box. And we try. And we might climb mountains, or we might go on a retreat, or we might take a nap or go on a jog, and we're going to try to think out of the box. I'm telling you that the way to think out of the box is to literally go into other boxes. <laughs> So how do we have our best flashes of insight? Our best flashes of insight are going to come when you're able to get all the pieces that you need, and you're going to be able to combine them in a way that's useful and novel. Right? So that's what's happening in the example of the ice cream of Henry Ford, Netflix, Google. Take any great product. And that's what's happening. It's the pieces are coming together in a way that works. But you can do this. It doesn't, it's not magic, and it's not rocket science. One of the other critiques we often have is that large organizations can't possibly do this because large organizations become static and inert and nobody cares and blah, 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 blah. You know, you can. But you have to be very strategic and systematic about this very concept that I just pointed out about out of the box. So the choice map that you are, that's uh, core to the Think Bigger book is something I stole, with permission, I stole from General Electric from a man named Lloyd Trotter. What put Jack Welch on the map 
when GE was doing amazing was a, um, a guy by the name of Lloyd Trotter. He was the first African American to work at General Electric. And he had a very simple method. He started by saying, look, well, these factories are doing really well at this. And these factories are not doing so well. But they're doing really well at this other thing. And he had them swap techniques, swap knowledge. Jack Welch noticed this and brought it to the larger organization. Remember, in its height, it had so many businesses ranging from financial services to making soap, to making soap operas, to making appliances, you name it. It was really diverse. And so what did they used to do in their retreats? They would literally have a company, like any one of their businesses, report on a problem. So you just came here with your innovations. You can report, they would come and a manager would report on a problem and then the leaders of the other businesses would say how if they had had a similar problem and how did they solve it. And they would essentially collect these solutions in a Trotter matrix and export it within the company to other businesses, which is how they were all learning from each other. Now, of course, when Jack Welch left, then they stopped this practice, and I, I don't know what else happened, but they all left, so the, the practice changed. But we can do this today. We can still do this with a combination of Google and with a com combination of companies learning from within. All right. I'm going to now show you the choice map. How we're doing on time, Eleanor? 308. OK. So did you guys do your homework? Did you actually come with problems? OK. So if you didn't, that's OK. I still have an exercise. I just, my most important goal today is for you to just get a hang of how to do choice mapping, because I think you can really use this on your own back in your company. So I'm going to use a, a, um, an everyday example. My most important goal here is just to get you choice mapping, because that's the fundamental tool of Think Bigger. And it's essentially exactly what we were talking about, I made the, the way the mind works, but this is more strategic. It's more deliberative so that you don't have to worry, wait for it to happen randomly while you're on a uh, jog. OK, so what is a choice map? So a choice map, so this is a small choice map. I think of this as a three by three. Um, at the top, we define a problem. So I picked a problem that uh, is, you know, how do you make a business card? OK, now. Now, remember I said you have to define the problem in as precise terms as you can. And so what's the problem I'm going to define for myself? How do I create a business card which shows people that what I'm doing is impressive? You know, and uh, is impressive, and, and I need to also make my card memorable. All right? OK, so now, what are the big challenges in making a business card? Well, how do I make it unique? How do I make sure it's a good representation of who I am? And how do I make sure people know I'm important? OK, now you could also add, how do I make sure that people don't, uh, that people don't lose my card? Right? That, that's something I could, could add. Uh, but let's stick to these three for now. And remember I said you can go up to five. Somewhere between, you know, uh, anywhere from, say, two to five. Or actually, you can even do one if it's a smallish problem. OK. So now, let's look at what happens in the row. How do I make it unique? So first cell on the row, I find the best example of somebody doing it already in the industry. Right? So what's Harry Houdini doing? He makes his business card a triangle, a new shape. OK, so usually it's helpful to use Google or your network to find out who's doing the best at this thing. And first, you're going to look at your industry, who is the best thing 
that's in the industry and how are they doing it? What are they doing? So what you're populating in your choice map are the strategies, the tactics. So the first is within industry, but then in order to get those really out of the box solutions, right? You're gonna look in other boxes. And so who else does interesting things with cards to make them unique? Well, what about when we go into Saks Fifth Avenue and they hand us cards with perfume scent? It's a way of showcasing their perfume. Or what about other ways of showcasing your product in a way that's kind of unique, but also similarly small? What about like Hershey's Kisses and the way they wrapped it? It's an interesting example, wrapping. Okay, so notice three entirely different ways of making something small, unique looking. The first came from within industry, the other two came from totally different industries. So I'm learning best, pra I'm collecting best practices from other industries. By the way, stop me if you have a question. Okay, the second challenge is, well, it has to be an expression of who I am. Well, again, let's look at the business card within industry. Andy Warhol, here's what he did. Very much on brand for him. Well, but what are some other things uh, other industries have done? Well, what about like Tom's and, you know, indicating the charity that I give to? That's a way to show who you are and what you believe in and what you stand for. Or what about Star Wars and their use of font? Became iconic. Okay, now let's take the third challenge, which is... How do I make sure people know I'm important? Well, Hillary Clinton used the seal on hers to remind people who she was. Okay, and that's within industry. And by the way, there's no, uh, these are not the only examples, obviously. I picked, this is one set. You could have an entirely different choice map. Um, the key here is just to find examples of success. Okay, then you have autograph. And they even had autograph auctions. Then you have influencers. All right, so what I'm gonna have you do is on your notebook, I want you to try this, okay? Here's how this works, is you take, if you think of another example, actually before you try this, okay, so can, can people think of another example for row one? How do you make it unique? I, I used to work for a movie ticket company and our business cards were shaped like old movie tickets. Okay, old movie tickets, good. You can add texture. Okay, add texture, good. Okay, now what about who am I? Give me another example for who am I that could be added to the row. Voice. What? Your sound, your voice. Okay, your voice, good. What's another one? Add your picture, yes, good. Okay, what about important? Okay, the thickness, sure, okay. The weight. What else? Try to think way out of the box. What can people have, have you seen people do to look important? Font. Yeah, well, we, we, we have font, with, uh, what else? Sort of a hue on the card. Sure, color, color, okay, color. yes. Material, right? Material, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Simplify. What? Simplify. Simplify, sure. Yeah. Yes, in fact, that's a beautiful principle you just pointed out. In fact, we tend to, when we want to be creative, add your title. Add your title, okay, yes. Um, can you think of other industries that have to worry about these problems and have done something interesting that might be useful? Okay, QR code, sure, okay. That's a way to make sure people don't lose it. Um, what else? Hmm? Ah, 
Ah, oh, okay, interesting, sure. Like influencers have done that, sure. What are some other industries that have done things that might be, you know, imported in? You can put a, a special code just for friends. Mm-hmm, okay, yeah. It's like the sort of VIP kind of thing. Okay, cool, okay, you guys are getting the idea. Now, our tendency is to first look at adjacent industries, but if you were to do the research, you can look back and see, let's say, what did people do to make themselves memorable back in the 1700s? And that might give you an interesting idea. Don't be afraid to look at really totally different industries or totally different points in time. So I'm going to give you two minutes. I guess two minutes is my favorite time. <laughs> two minutes on a piece of paper to create for yourself a unique business card, like a design. And all, oh, and the way you do this, I want you to do choice mapping, because I don't want you to just randomly, willy-nilly put stuff. I want you to take one option per row. All right, show them what I mean, Eleanor. One option per row. So let's say you could take Harry Houdini, plus Star Wars, plus, no, what? Autograph, Autograph sure. <laughs> um, and, uh, but you don't have to use those three, but you just take one per row, line them up in your imagination, and then ask yourself, what could I create for me with these tactics in mind? What could my business card look like? Okay, so just pick three tactics and come up with a new business card. So, should we play ready? Yeah. Okay, get started. Okay. Okay. Are we good? All right. So, who wants to share their idea? Well, I cheated because I already have it, so I didn't have to do it. Our business card has a will be try to do. Yeah, but you didn't use choice mapping. Uh, well, I think I did, but oh, I just didn't do it right this second. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll come back to yours. Let me okay. do somebody who used it, who did it just now in real time. Oh, so, so be. Yes. So I did this shape as a table or airplane. Yes. I have an airplane flying through prison. I mean, hypothetically, I don't. But yeah, that's an yes. aspiration. Yes. <laughs> it opens up to speak the name of the flying school. Good. And hashtag a number of trips made so far. 
Very nice. Wow. Wow, that's great. You did that in two minutes? <laughs> wow. Okay, I'm impressed. Okay, Susan? So this is a travel company, right? That you're okay. Good. Oh, okay. Very interesting. Okay. So now Steve will hear yours. Oh, Udaya. Hold on. All right. Let me hear his. Memorable card. A clock covered. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of who I am, uh, just write the impact lines. I thought of the eulogy thing, and if I can kind of bring it up, uh, helping 10,000 girls dream mm. of ten, transforming 10,000 villages. Right, the like the Tom's just shoe. Yeah. On the impact part. yeah, yeah. And then uh, impression why I am important, that was the most difficult part. Maybe I think the 10,000 becomes a counter. It's like almost like an airline. Mm. Like How so many like more 10, people are growing, essentially. Yes. Nice. I like it. All right. Well, let's give everybody a round of applause. That's great. I love it. Okay. Uh. All right. So do you guys get a sense of how choice mapping works? Yes? You see how this works? Now, we just picked a, an example that's a good everyday example, but hopefully still useful and fun. But you can do this for anything, right? So, you know, uh, whatever the problem is, even if it's a so smallish problem, what you're asking yourself is, who has solved this problem successfully? And don't just focus on your industry. Ask yourself, who would have had to have solved a similar sort of problem in a totally different industry? And that's what you either look up or you pick up the phone and you find that kind of person. Because in reality, people are far more willing to share information, particularly when you're not a competitor. Right? And it's not illegal to be learning what's going on in a totally different industry and figuring out ways to adapt and refine and revise that. That is part of the human experience. Now, the way choice mapping works when you're, wor when you're thinking about a very complex problem, because we picked um, you know, a, a business card I think you can do in a three by three. There are some problems where you could just look for you know, one, uh, like just one sub problem. Um, always, by the way, get at least three tactics. Now, when we're doing a serious problem, like you're trying to start a startup, you're trying to create a new product line, you're trying to cut costs in an organization, there what, we, what I have people do is I have them create a choice map, and the prototypic choice map is a five by five. So the problem is at the top. Remember to always phrase that as a question and spend a lot of time thinking about what that problem is. By the way, if you're a leader and you walk into that room, don't just announce the problem. Ask each person to first think about what the problem is from their perspective and have them write it down. Don't have them just start talking. Then the loudest voice you know, takes, basically runs the show. Collect the different versions of the problem. You may think the problem is self-evident. It won't be. So uh, spend time defining that problem on the top. Then actually also get people to break it down. What are the challenges that they're seeing? And so for any given problem, there'll be hundreds and hundreds of lots of sub-problems or challenges. Identify the top five or three, if you can boil it down. The fewer, the easier. But you want to make sure that the sub-problems are actually solvable and not redundant with each other. 
And now per row, in the first cell, you can find what is the best practice already being used in your industry. But after that, the other four should be from totally different industries. And yes, that's not easy. It takes time. This is why it's useful to have other people on a team work with you. Have everybody do research independently of one another, and they will collect far more interesting tactics for that choice map than if you have them do it together. In general, if you have people first work by themselves and then share, they will generate about three times more quantity and more diversity, which is diversity is even more relevant here, of information and ideas. So you create a five by five choice map. Now sometimes, if you define the problem and you break it down, that in itself is a helpful exercise, you will discover by simply breaking it down, the option already exists. The solution already exists. It was staring at you. You just didn't see it. Perfect. Pick up that solution. Run with it. You don't need to invent something if it already exists. If, on the other hand, you still need to solve the problem, then you, full, then you create your full choice map. And now what you do is you take what you did like with the business card. You take one option per row. So think of a five by five as essentially giving you 25 different bits to work with in your mind. And by the way, yes, you can do this with ChatGPT, but you have to feed ChatGPT because ChatGPT does not do quality control. <laughs> Notice what we're doing here. We're doing a lot of quality control. We are only populating the row with things that are useful. They all, had to be, they all have to be successful examples. No failures are in this choice map. And so now what you do is you take each set of five, line them up in your head, and ask your brain, what would you imagine? And yes, you can even ask ChatGPT to help you imagine. And it'll give you some interesting ideas, just like with the toothpick, you have to keep asking it over and over again, and it'll finally give you something different. Um, but in a five by five, you can generate 3,125 unique solutions. Here's what's great about a choice map. If you're stuck, you don't have to go unstuck yourself by you know, going to take a shower or going for a drive or any of that. It's very straightforward what you do. You pick a new set of five options from your choice map and ask yourself, what could I do with that? Or ask ChatGPT, what could she do with that? You can swap out one of the tactics from your choice map and get a new tactic. That in itself will generate even more solutions. It's a very deliberative way to keep generating and generating more solutions until you find the one that's right. How do you get useful? Well, by definition, you are only populating the choice map with useful tactics. How do you get novel? Notice how you are combining things from different industries, much like the way Picasso and Nancy Johnson and Henry Ford did. So I, I know I'm running out of time, and you guys need to go, so I'm going to quickly end here. Hmm? Oh, we do have time? OK. Oh, OK. Great. That's just perfect. OK, so um, as, uh, as the French polymath Henri Poincaré once said, invention consists of avoiding the constructing of useful, useless combinations and consists of the constructing of useful combinations, which are an infinite minority. To invent is to discern, to choose. Now, Henri Poincaré was actually the inspiration behind both Picasso and Einstein. And if you look at the choice map and choice mapping, it's essentially 
the operationalization or the application of exactly what he's saying in that quote. So I want to propose a corollary to you, which is to choose is to invent. You can use the choice map to create multiple meaningful choices. You just got to get in the practice of doing it. It's like learning any new exercise routine. Once you do it a few times, it'll become almost second nature. Now, you've got a lot of options, right? A lot of solutions here, and how do you choose? Right, because 3,125, and by the way, make sure that different members of your team do it, do choice mapping separately so that they, not two, no two people see the same uh, solution in the same way. They'll imagine what to do with that set of five options differently. How do you pick? And I don't want you to prototype every single idea. That's no, that makes no sense. It's a waste of money. So we also have a special technique by which we pick, right? So yes, all of them are useful, all of them can be novel, but some of them are going to be far more clunky. You want the whole to be greater than the sum of the parts, right? You want it to feel intuitive. How do we figure out what's going to be intuitive? So the second technique we have in addition to the choice map is something called the third eye which is, do you see what I see? And to illustrate to you this idea, I'm going to go back to art. So who made this painting? You guys are going to become, you're going to have so much expertise tonight when you go home. Does anyone know who made this painting? It's not Picasso. <laughs> Who made this painting? The second one. Hmm? This one's Picasso. OK. So the, but did you notice this time they're very similar, right? The first one's done by Brock, his contemporary. They actually even lived together for a little while. The second one is done by Picasso. Anyone here like think about Brock much? <laughs> no, right? All right, very similar. Could easily be confused. Why is Picasso a household name and not Brock? So a number of years ago, a number of us from Columbia got together with um, MoMA, and we did a network analysis of all the Impressionist artists. And they actually had it on display. Um, now you can just go online. They took it down. But I'm going to show you the network analysis. And this is a network analysis of all the Impressionist artists from the early 1900s. Notice where Picasso is. So it's not just that he knew all the artists in Impressionism. He knew art dealers. He knew art critics. He knew other kinds of artists like de Boisy. Now, networking has a bad name. It's a bad rap. None of, us, none of us like to be networked. None of us like to have that awful feeling of being the kind of person that is a networker. But there's something else that's really, really important for ideation, and that's idea working. Because when I describe to you my idea, and then I see how you see it, and I see what you retain, and I see how you describe it, I learn a lot. And so in the third eye, what I do is what I have people do is I have them take their idea, and you don't prototype it, and you go up to people, a mix of experts and non-experts, and you describe your idea. You don't ask them, do you like it? Do you hate it? Nobody cares. That's not actually the useful stuff. What you really need to know is how would they describe it back to you? 
First, you do what we call a playback. How would they describe it back to you? Because when they describe it back to you, you see what they remembered. It's not a memory test, but it'll feel like it. Really what you're learning is what stuck. And like in the case of Emily, what did you do with the blank space? You had to put, you put something in there. What did you imagine? What did you put in there? And maybe, maybe the ideator learned something interesting by seeing what you stuck in there that I might not have thought of. The other thing you do is you ask people, hey, you know, I, I've got this idea. H how would you describe my idea if it were you? Again, what you're seeing is what it means to them. And that's how you little by little make sure that not only is the idea one that people can relate to, but you learn what's the core of it that is actually sticky. It's when there is an alignment between what I intend and what you see, that's when you actually have an idea where you can ask yourself, is this something worth pursuing? And that's the beauty of what Picasso did. He was able by speaking, by idea working and sh constantly showing people his stuff, he's seeing how they're interpreting, he's seeing how they're responding, and he's learning from that. That's actually a very, very important part of the idea ideation process itself. So I don't see that as separate. It's part of ideation. Um, In fact, uh, do I have another minute to maybe describe one yeah, more? Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. In fact, during the pandemic, I had the opportunity to interview Paul McCartney. And you know that song, Yesterday? And so if you read the story books, it'll tell you that he woke up one morning and the tune was in his head and the world's never been the same. It's true he woke up one morning with the tune, and he was in the back bedroom of his uh, girlfriend's dad's house, um, which is in Marylebone, London. But it wasn't that straightforward. He heard the tune, and he, he, he didn't know whether he, he, he dreamed it in his brain. He didn't know whether he was repeating something he'd heard from childhood. Was it worth something, not worth something? So. He quickly came up with some, some lines to this tune. So it was scrambled eggs, scrambled eggs. Oh, my lady, you have such lovely legs. Those were the original lines. <laughs> okay. And so then he's like humming the tune to random people. And he doesn't ask them, do you like this? He says, have you ever heard this before? Does this sound familiar? And after he realizes, after a while, no, 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 it's, it's familiar but not familiar. No one's ever heard this exact tune before. Only after doing that for a few months does he realize, OK, it's time for me to actually put some real lyrics to this thing. And then he builds it out and actually puts the, plays it on the guitar. And then he gives it to other people, including his manager, and plays the song for them. And the, and the manager says, you know, I think we could imagine this song with a quartet in the background rather than a guitar. And Paul McCartney is like, what? But I'm a rock and roll band. He goes, oh, look, Paul, let me just show you what I'm imagining. And then if you hate it, we'll go back to the guitar. And then they played it on the guitar. I mean, they played it with the string quartet, and they loved it. And as you know, that was probably the most famous song in what, the last 50 years? Uh, yesterday, the most played song? Um, all right, so choice mapping and third eye are probably the two most important things to keep in mind and think bigger, and I want you to try it and practice it. Um, I've been teaching it to MBA students for the last eight years. A number of them have started to create different businesses, different ideas. They are certainly using it as corporate entrepreneurs. When the, when the world shut down, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, had me 
uh, serve as an advisor for something they called the wisdom councils because they needed solutions really fast to some pretty important problems. I'm gonna give you one ex important example since you guys were sharing uh, your most uh, proud innovations. Um, in the Wisdom Council, what we would do is we would bring people from lots of different industries to come in and try to solve a problem, and this was all done on Zoom. So remember the ventilator crisis? Who else worries about breathing? Well, NASA and uh, snorkeling mask company. And so one combination was we took a snorkeling mask company and combined them with a 3D printing company. And so the 3D printing company cre created a 3D printed valve that was placed inside the snorkeling mask, which was used as temporary breathing devices in Europe, where there was a real shortage of ventilators. Um, NASA, in 37 days, created a portable briefcase size ventilator machine. And obviously, we didn't need that later on. But in 37 days, created a small ventilator, which now is used in remote parts of Africa uh, because it, it's an easy to use machine, doesn't require a doctor, and doesn't collect dust. Um, so that's just an ex some examples. My dream is that people will realize that creativity really is in your hands. You really can come up with important solutions. You really can think bigger. You can come up with the solutions that affect your personal lives, that affect your professional lives, and I'm hoping someday we'll make a better world. So with that, thank you.